Welcome. In this video, we're going to be talking about the agricultural revolution that resulted in the move from what we call primal culture and religion to archaic culture and religion. Um, first off, you have a file that hopefully you have open or printed out or whatever. And uh, the first page is very simple here. Um, we're going to define a couple terms. When we talk about primal peoples, we're talking about prehistoric, pre-literate, nomadic hunter-gatherers. This is before humans have written language. They are uh, in small uh, tribal groups or family groups, and they are almost constantly moving, uh, going where they need to to find the food they need to survive. Then we have an event that occurs from about 10,000 BCE to about 6,500 BCE uh, in different parts of the world that we call the Agricultural Revolution. The Agricultural Revolution uh, is the advent of what we call the Neolithic Age or the New Stone Age. You have another file that is a timeline uh, that shows you uh, exactly where the Agricultural Revolution is on that timeline, but again, it's from about 10,000 BCE to about 6,500 BCE. Sometimes uh, when we're talking about a large span of time, we will pick a target date to reference. A target date, uh, as you might uh, imagine, is something somewhere in the middle of a long period of time. If you're throwing darts or shooting arrows at a target, you're trying to hit the bullseye in the middle. So a target date is something in the middle of the period. So for the agricultural revolution, a nice round target date in the middle of the span of time is about 8,000 BCE. So we'll use that for our target date. Circa 8,000 BCE. When you see that little C with a period, that means circa or about. Uh, if you speak Spanish, it's the same thing as cerca, about, in the proximity of. The reason that this period is so long, from 10,000 to 6,500 BCE, is because of two things. Number one, it starts different times in different places around the world. In the uh, fertile Sumer Valley that uh, uh, becomes ancient Mesopotamia and later Babylon, and is today called Iraq, where um, the, some of the first uh, archaic civilizations were founded, the agricultural revolution begins somewhere around 8,000, excuse me, somewhere around 10,000 BCE, or about 12,000 years before present. Uh, in the New World, in North America, where uh, I'm located, and I think you are too, uh, most scholars think it probably begins around 6500 BCE, somewhere uh, substantially later. So the first reason that it's such a long span of time is that it begins in different places, uh, in different parts of the world. The second reason is that um, learning about how to domesticate agriculture doesn't happen in a short period of time. Humans are learning about this for many centuries and many millennia. They're gaining uh, more specialized information about how to make this work, about how to make plants grow successfully where you want to grow them and what they need to survive and bring forth fruit and so on, um, learning about uh, the best areas to transplant them, learning how to divert water sources, uh, irrigation. And um, so anyway, this is a long period of time. Now, we are going to call the period after the agricultural revolution the archaic period. First of all, archaic means really, really, really old, but never as old as first. And primal means first. Prime means first either in importance or in time. If we talk about the prime directive, as we did in an earlier uh, video, that would be the number one directive or the number one rule. Um, when we talk about primal peoples, we're talking about first in time. So archaic means very old, but not as old as first. In the archaic period, after the domestication of agriculture, People no longer have to be nomadic. They can stay in one place, or they can be sedentary. <clears throat> so these sedentary agriculturalists are looking for land that, um, first of all, is fertile. Plants will grow there. Second of all, there's some kind of a water source, even if it has to be diverted into their farmlands. And third, ideally, it will be a location that is easily defensible. But that's not always the case. In the uh, archaic period, many tribes... Uh, coalesce, and uh, we end up having the first urban developments uh, where many people come together and found a city-state, and they usually build stone or uh, mud-brick walls around the city 
because if you have a lot of valuable things in one place, other people will try to come and take them away from you. So you have to protect your development. So we're getting into the age of uh, the first city-states here. <clears throat> so let's talk about how uh, society and culture and religion changes from the one period, from the primal period to the archaic period. On the next slide here, we have two columns, one primal, one archaic. <clears throat> we're going to uh, do the first part of the primal area down to where you see the space. And then we're going to jump over to the archaic here and talk about the differences there. Then we're going to come back to the primal again for the second uh, part below that space there, and again over to the archaic after that. Now, what this space represents for us today is the top uh, subjects relate more to just the structure of society, whereas the bottom subjects are the things that we think uh, more of as being religious. Now, I'm only doing this because of the way we think today. Please remember that in ancient societies, whether primal or archaic, people were not uh, thinking about some division of what is sacred and what is secular, or the separation of church and state, or any such thing. That doesn't exist. Religion kind of legitimates all of life. But again, this is uh, because of the way that we think today. So first of all, as we said, primal, primal people are nomadic. They're always moving. They're hunter-gatherers. They're hunting animals that they need to survive, and they're gathering uh, roots and grains and fruits and whatever. They're small-scale communities, um, family uh, communities. In fact, when we say a tribe, that just basically means an extended family. So uh, these are family groups. They are egalitarian. That means everybody's basically equal. Now there is going to be someone who's going to be the patriarch or matriarch of the tribe simply by the fact, uh, usually that they're the oldest, they've been around the longest, they're respected. Um, but again, that's kind of like it would be in your family, you know, where grandpa, great grandpa, everybody calls him sir and respects him. Um, the leaders are not really gaining any advantage by being leaders. Um, you know, what do they get? A bigger big screen TV, a faster car, a better house? No, they're all uh, in one tribe together. And if the hunt is successful, they all eat. If the hunt is not successful, they all starve. So again, uh, even though there might be a leader, a chief or whatever, they're all basically equal. Now, they're not uh, precisely the same in terms of function, though. The males are generally the ones that hunt, and the females generally the ones that gather. While the males may uh, tend to be bigger or stronger than the females, that is not the main reason why. The main reason why is that reproduction is kind of a prime directive. We need to uh, reproduce enough human beings so the next generation of the tribe can survive. So fertility um, is very much honored. And females are, uh, of course, uh, wanting to have children, and um, most females who are fertile are going to have uh, many of them eventually. They might have a couple of uh, children that are uh, less than a year apart, one on each breast, and a uh, virtual kindergarten class of kids following them around. It's not nice to take the small kids out to hunt the woolly mammoth because they tend to get trampled. So the main reason the females aren't doing the hunting is because their number one responsibility is caring for the offspring. Um, so they tend to do things that are less uh, disastrous to the children uh, in terms of gathering food. Of course, that's a lot less uh, dangerous. Um, nonetheless, even though the males and females have different functions, they uh, are both valuable. In fact, females are highly um, regarded. And a female that is fertile uh, is, uh, well, that's the ideal. We have, um, you might have read in your book, uh, Venus figurines, which are idealist, uh, idealistic structures, uh, um, carvings, if you will, um, of uh, the female, uh, the ideal female. And uh, the uh, body type is not exactly what we might consider ideal today. Uh, very, very, very wide hips and big watermelon breasts but this is seen as, uh, as being beautiful because this woman is a baby-making machine. Uh, she uh, is one of the ones who's going to be responsible for the tribe surviving uh, another generation. Uh, we'll see that when we get to the archaic period, uh, the focus uh, changes uh, a little bit from the focus on females um, and the reverence of females. Um, anyway, uh, as an egalitarian society, um, they also have a collective identity. And what that means is the tribe lives or dies uh, together. 
Um, and there is nobody uh, that really has a different identity. Um, your identity is the tribe that you are a part of. And if the tribe survives, you survive. Your value is the value that you provide for the tribe uh, in terms of helping it to survive. <clears throat> now, I'm sure people have names, uh, phonetic sounds that are made to get their attention. Um, but the idea that people have some kind of individuality just doesn't exist. What makes one person different from another? Uh, or I should say, what under the person's control uh, can make them different from another? Can they wear different clothes or go to a different college or drive a different car? Um, in their society, there is no ideal that they need to somehow um, promote their individuality or their individualism. This is just something that doesn't really exist. And this might be hard for us to wrap our heads around. You're going to find out when we get to archaic society, they don't really have the same kind of idea of individuality or individualism that we have today either, uh, even though they uh, do represent a bit of an evolution in how they think about differences between people. But we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, this is oral culture. They are pre-literate. Please don't ever call them illiterate. Illiterate implies that writing exists and somebody has not successfully learned how to do it, how to read and write. But writing does not exist. They have language, obviously, but they haven't learned how to make abstract marks that can be translated into speech. Um, they might be painting pictures of uh, animals on cave walls in France, but these aren't letters. Letters are arbitrary markings. If I write C-A-T on the board, there's nothing about that word that looks anything like a cat, but it will put the picture of a cat in everybody's mind. Um, so that's what I mean when I say they're abstract marks. In our language, of course, they're phonetic, but in other languages, they may not be phonetic at all. Um, so uh, this is what we're talking about with primal. So because they are preliterate, they are also prehistoric. Obviously, we have no history if we have no letters. And literacy, well, the root of that word is letter. You might think literacy. Once humans learn to use letters to record things, they are literate. So these people are preliterate. Let's bounce over to the archaic here and talk about some things that change. Well, once again, when humans learn how to make crops grow where they want them to be, and they learn how to curtail the grazing range of animals so they don't have to track them for long distances, they can stay in one place. They become sedentary. Domestic agriculture means, well, the term domestic means that uh, we have taken something and we have somehow changed it to serve our purposes. At this point, as we mentioned before, there's a merging of cultures. We're going to need a lot of tribes coming together to be able to defend this city-state that we're founding here, um, this urban area. So this is the birth of large-scale urbanization or large city-states. This is where it gets really interesting. And that is, in this city-state, for the first time, not everybody has the same function. Um, now we have all kinds of different vocations, uh, just starting with the city wall. Somebody has to design it. Somebody has to build it. Somebody has to cut the stone. Somebody has to make the mud bricks. And when the wall's built, somebody has to construct the gate structure and plant it. And there are soldiers that guard the city, and there are officers over the soldiers, and there are people that make their clothing or their armor or their weapons. And we haven't even got past the city wall there, and we've, you know, we've got seven or eight different vocations there. So we've got everything from shepherds and farmers all the way up to the city managers, uh, which uh, at one point become kings. Um, and uh, certainly the people that are on the highest levels of society are not generally associating with people on the lowest levels of society, except as necessary to do business. We have begun what we call stratified society. A stratum is a layer. Strata is plural, means layers. So stratified means society is in layers, and the layers are determined by vocational diversity, or as you see on your sheet there, diversification of labor, which means the same thing. Everybody's not doing the same thing. So now people have different values in society, and their value is determined by what they do, by the service they provide to society. Obviously, the captain of the host is worth an awful lot more and has an awful lot more power than somebody who is a shepherd or somebody who makes copper pots. Simple. Now, this uh, division, this valuation based on vocation, results in what we call individuation. 
there's now a sense of personal identity, but it's linked to your vocation. Now, let me just remind you, individuation is not the same thing as individualism or individualization. Individuation is different. Firstly, it is based on your vocation. The reason that it's different from today is that today you have some choice, ideally, what vocation you pursue. And while some people have more advantages than others, theoretically, you can choose to be what you want to be, whatever kind of individual you want to be. People did not have that power back then. In fact, nobody's really thinking about the fact probably that they ought to be able to have uh, that kind of power. If you are the son of a shepherd, you're going to be a shepherd. If you're the son of a cobbler, you're going to be a cobbler. If you're the son of someone who makes copper pots, you're going to learn how to make copper pots and take over your daddy's business. You don't have much choice about it. So individuation means your value is based on your vocation and your personal identity is based on your vocation. But the reason it's not individualization is because you don't really have a choice about who you are and who you are is based on vocation. There isn't this idea that everybody is supposed to be an individual, somehow unique, different from everyone else. So try to keep that in mind. Um, anyway, in this period, literacy develops. People learn how to learn, uh, they learn how to use letters to keep records. Um, most scholars believe the first records probably have to do with trade agreements and so on. Uh, but after this, um, eventually people realized that they could actually use these letters to record uh, important uh, sacred stories or histories or whatever. And so this is when we start getting the earliest uh, uh, epics. Uh, you might have heard of the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is uh, one of, if not the uh, earliest one that we have uh, existent today. So again, this is a literate society. Now, let's bounce back over to Primal here again back a few thousand years. And let's talk about their religion. First of all, uh, they tend to be more animistic. Now, wait a minute. How do I know this? Do I have a time machine? How can I go back in time and see this? Here's how we speculate about what primal peoples are like, the ancient hunter-gatherers. We have two data sources. One is material remains, anything they left behind. This can be grave sites. This can be tool-making sites, anything like that. And again, material remains... Uh, is the realm of archaeology. The second data source is what we call contemporary indigenous societies or religions. Contemporary means they're occurring now. Indigenous means they're native to whatever area they're living in. So whether you're talking about the Australian Aborigines or African tribes or the tribes in the uh, you know, South American Amazon basin or Eskimos, Inuits, whatever, the point is there's no record in history of these people migrating uh, from some other civilization to settle where they settled. They have been there since prehistory. Another thing that's unique about them is that these tribal groups were separated from the development of uh, the most advanced modern civilizations for thousands of years. And because of this, anthropologists believe that they bear a lot more resemblance to the community structure and family ties of the prehistoric primal hunter-gatherer tribes. Now, obviously, there are some things that have developed over time. They've had their own uh, uh, agricultural revolution to some degree over time, um, but it is mainly in terms of the tribal social structure that they most resemble these ancient societies. They also have some religious ideas that are similar, too. So this is how we know about these things. Um, the realm of material domain, re, excuse me, material remains, the realm of archaeology, and um, contemporary indigenous tribal societies or religions, which is the realm of uh, anthropology. Um, animism is an idea that everything has some kind of life force or animating spirit, and not just things that we would think of as being animated, um, but, uh, you know, trees, rivers, mountains, rocks, um, everything has some kind of an anima uh, that gives it its identity, that gives it its existence. And um, one of the reasons uh, is because to primal humans, the world is fairly enchanted, if you want to use the term a lot of religious uh, study scholars use. Um, they haven't domesticated anything. The world is a big, dangerous place with lots of forces out of their control, and they're a very small part of it. 
and they haven't developed this attitude that they're somehow superior and they ought to be able to control things. So they're a little bit more humble about their existence. So they see all the other things in this world as things that are existing and in the case of the uh, uh, greater mammals, trying to survive in the same kind of uh, existence that they are. So when you look at, for instance, the higher mammals, uh, the primal humans, they're not really thinking that they're greater than these animals. Yes, they have to take one down to eat to survive, but they don't see them as lesser life forms or just commodities. In fact, um, when they take one down, they often uh, give great thanks and reverence to the animal, um, much as if the animal laid down its life so that they could survive. There's a great deal of reverence for the animal. Uh, if you ever saw uh, the uh, movie Avatar, an uh, amazing movie, James Cameron, Cameron did a wonderful job, but in this uh, fictional indigenous culture on another planet, uh, there's a place near the end of the movie where the uh, kind of avatar spy, if you will, has really kind of become part of the tribe and really is identifying with it. And he and his girlfriend have just killed some kind of deer or roebuck or something. And uh, they actually uh, get down on their knees next to the animal uh, as it dies uh, and actually ask the animal to forgive them. I'm not sure if forgiveness is uh, uh, what they would be asking for, if they'd be giving the animal reverence or whatever, but James Cameron's really getting it right. There's a reverence for the animal laying down its life. It's not like the animal exists just to die for them. Um, and we'll talk about how this changes. Um, so again, the higher mammals, um, humans are thinking they're pretty much equal to them. They don't know that they don't have a language of their own, uh, that they don't think on the same level that we do. The ancient humans just think that they don't understand their language, but they don't really recognize that they are outthinking the animals, that they're uh, superior in that way. Ancestrism is the idea, it begins with the idea that your ancestors are still staying with you after they die. Um, at this point, nobody's thinking about some alternative reality that they go to. Uh, they certainly are in a different form, a spiritual form or a soul form, um, but they're thought to exist in this same world, and there are some places, sometimes sacred places, uh, where it's thought that one is closer to them or one can contact them. But the important thing to remember is that uh, primal peoples think that their ancestors can have some control over their lives and uh, uh, reverencing them is very, very important. And um, actually, ancestor reverence is still big all over the world, with the exception of North America and some places in Europe. Obviously, people aren't thinking in quite the same way, but still the idea uh, in many cultures is that if you don't adequately respect your elders and respect your history and those that came before you, that that's a shameful thing. You've somehow failed ethically as a person. Um, so anyway, um, Nature-based worship, they're not, of course, constructing permanent buildings of any kind. They're always moving. So um, there are places in nature they consider to be more sacred places. Um, mountains, tall trees, hidden valleys, uh, whatever. Shamans. Now, this is interesting because the indigenous cultures of today, the contemporary indigenous uh, tribal cultures we're talking about, most of them uh, give a, uh, a tremendous amount of importance to the person fulfilling uh, this function as a shaman, male or female, often called medicine men or medicine women because, uh, uh, how should we say, intervening with the spiritual powers that be to try and alleviate disease uh, is one of the main things that they do. Um, and there are other things as well. They might try to bless a hunt, but they are the people that go back and forth between the spirit realm and this realm and try to consult the powers uh, that be and elicit some kind of favor from them. We're not sure how, how far back shamanism goes. While it's a very big thing in contemporary indigenous uh, cultures, uh, again, we're not sure how far it goes back into prehistory or whatever. Next, totemic bond with animals. There is usually at least one animal that um, the tribe will consider in some sense to be sacred. This animal uh, both uh, may represent in some sense their identity, they may identify with it, uh, mainly because the animal is uh, trying to survive in the same kind of situations that humans are, and this animal uh, is rocking it like a boss. Um, there's an old book called The Clan of the Cave Bear, and they made a movie out of it. I think it was the first movie that made Daryl Hannah famous, but that's a great example. Um, the Clan of the Cave Bear is not hunting the cave bear for dinner. Cave bears off limits as a meal. 
And um, they would consider that bear kind of a formidable foe anyway. They probably wouldn't want to hunt it. But the bear, um, they very much identify with because this bear is at the top of the food chain. Nobody's looking for the bear for dinner. The bear is doing a great job of surviving. And in some sense, not only does the tribe want to identify it with him, but the tribe thinks the bear, in some sense, is their benefactor. Imagine this. Darkness is coming. It's nighttime. And the tribe wants to get inside a cave or enclosed space somewhere because there are nocturnal uh, predators that come out at night that think humans are just really nicely tasty. So if you are actually out in the night air, your smell can be carried a great distance and these predators may smell you. So you want to be in a cave or an enclosed area so your scent does not travel and you can survive. So imagine a little tribe of primal humans going into a cave, hoping to stay there for the night, and all of a sudden they hear a deep growl from the cave, and they realize, oh no, cave bear's in the cave, and they all go running out. Because, you know, if cave bear's using the cave, you can't use the cave. Nobody argues with cave bear. He kinda, he's kind of the boss. So they keep looking, and they eventually find another cave. Fortunately, cave bear's not in it. And so they give thanks to cave bear, because cave bear... Uh, in his kindness, has left one of his caves unoccupied so the humans can stay there and survive the night. Thank you, Cave Bear. Can you wrap your head around this kind of thinking? You can think of the Pacific Northwest, Oregon, Washington, uh, back uh, in the period of tribal humans. Um, they probably eat a lot of fish. You've probably seen the uh, videos of the salmon swimming upstream uh, to spawn before they die and how they're uh, by the hundreds and thousands jumping over the rapids and the waterfalls going back upstream. And it's not uncommon to see a couple big brown bears or a couple big grizzly bears sitting right smack in the middle of a river, just having a feast uh, as they jump out of the water, grabbing them. In fact, the bear could probably sit there with his mouth open and sooner or later a fish would jump right into it. If you've seen some of these movies where hundreds of them are jumping up um, in the same few seconds. So imagine a little tribe of humans who is really, really hungry and would like some fish, but the bear is sitting out in the river, and they're obviously not going to go in, out in the river and hang out with the bear. So imagine them imploring the bear to please let them have, you know, some fish. They won't take too many. Well, you know, after a while, it's, the bear is kind of full, and it, it's, it's nappy time. So the bear goes lumbering off to take a nap or whatever, and the humans are very, very grateful because the bear has actually left them some fish so they don't, uh, again, uh, starve. And uh, so you can probably understand how uh, these people would uh, uh, revere this animal or identify with this animal. And of course, back then we have oral myths. Uh, we do not yet have written myths as we talked about before. Now, let's go to archaic here. An interesting thing happens when we start domesticating agriculture. And this is agriculture now is our servant. And this includes... Uh, the greater mammals, because we've now constrained their gra grazing range. We have them in pens or pastures or whatever. Uh, we don't have to track them down. And so we have domesticated them. We now own them. They're no longer our equals. Um, we're no longer revering their existence as if it has value equal to ours. Instead, they're commodities. We own them. And we use them as we please. We can eat them if we like. We can sell them or trade them to get some benefit. So again, we don't have that same kind of respect for animals. However, they're still worth a lot. But again, they're not worth a lot uh, in terms of you know, the fact they're equal to us. They're not. We've domesticated them. They're worth a lot uh, because I can use them to trade for something that I need. Now at this point, we have this stratified society where everybody has different functions, different levels of power, and humans have a tendency to think about the higher realm, in this case, the realm of the gods, as being constructed somewhat like their city. We always imagine the highest level of culture or civilization um, as being you know, the kind of civilization of the gods. And in classical polytheism, you probably know that the gods have family relations and they have relations based on their vocation, uh, the natural uh, forces that they have power over or whatever. They're very much like humans uh, with superhuman powers. And so, again, humans are kind of uh, thinking about the powers that be now um, as persons, much like they are. And so they've domesticated a little bit 
but they still don't control an awful lot of things. They still are looking for some kind of control uh, about things they don't understand. And so they uh, start appealing to, uh, petitioning, uh, imploring these gods that they imagine to, to protect them, to bless them, to give them favors. And so the best way to get someone to give you a favor is to offer them a gift. I had a friend that came to me a number of years ago who was what we call ABT. He'd finished his master's uh, coursework, but he had not finished his thesis. He'd gotten a, a certain length of the way, and he kind of got himself uh, uh, kind of in a, in a cul-de-sac, thinking-wise, where you just don't know where to go. It's kind of like you're going through a maze, and you pick the wrong side, and you end up at a dead end. And you're not sure how far you have to back up to to make some sense out of it. But at a point like that, getting advice from someone who is outside of your little conundrum is very helpful. So anyway, my friend came to me and offered me $500 if I would meet with him a few times and help him get unstuck and get back on track in his thesis. Why did he offer me $500? Obviously because he thought I would be more likely to say yes if he offered me uh, $500 than if he didn't. Uh, in the end, I only ended up taking 100 bucks from him, and, and he got back on, on track fairly easily. Um, but the point is, if I had told him that even for $500, I just didn't really have the time, you know, I, I just I was too busy, what might he have done? He might have offered me more money, because there is an idea that things are worth a certain amount. And so humans get the idea that certain things they're asking for from the gods are worth a certain amount. And so what they start doing is giving the gods things that they consider themselves to be valuable. And again, these larger mammals are, are uh, some of the most valuable things. There's also grain offerings and wine offerings, but the larger mammals, anything that has a spilling of blood, this is seen as the most valuable sacrifices. So sacrifices start to be given to the gods to get favors from the gods, uh, to petition the gods, uh, also to give thanksgiving to the gods when something good has happened. Um, also to seek atonement from the gods if you feel like uh, somehow you've disappointed them. And um, we've talked about different kinds of rituals uh, uh, earlier uh, in this course. Anyway, so we have a whole group of people who specialize in performing these rituals. Instead of shamans, now we have what are called priests. And priests are the ones that actually sacrifice the animals, uh, drain their blood. Uh, sometimes that's used in some kind of ritual ceremony. Uh, cut the animal up. Certain pieces are burned on the altar as sacrifices to the god. Certain pieces are eaten in a ritual meal that's considered very, very sacred. Uh, the priests bless the people that have brought the sacrifices. And by the way, some of the cuts of the animals are actually the payment to the priests. So the priests are basically kind of like the holy butchers, if you will. And the places where these sacrifices are performed are called temples. So temples are where priests have a big old altar and they are uh, hacking up animals and burning different parts of the animals on the altars to obtain favor from the gods. Important to realize this because obviously we've redefined what temples are and priests are today, as most of us are not involved in religions where priests are hacking up cows or horses or something else, draining their blood and burning them on altars in front of the congregation. Uh, but that's what they meant originally. So in the agricultural uh, society here, the Society of Domestic Agriculture in the Archaic Period. This is when widespread animal sacrifice gets founded in sacrificial systems. You probably know that in some uh, societies, uh, one of them is one of the most famous is in Central America, the Society of the Mayans and the Aztecs and so on, uh, where human sacrifice uh, was a big part. Why did they start sacrificing humans? Well, obviously humans are thought to be worth more than animals. Um, so apparently they want something and the animals aren't working. And somebody figures that they, the gods probably want a greater sacrifice uh, to grant what the people are looking for. Um, kind of simple uh, to understand here. And um, by the way, what kind of humans would be most valuable? Uh, probably uh, babies because they haven't yet been tainted by the world. And the idea is the gods are going to take them and raise them as their own offspring. Uh, so parents are, you know, obviously very privileged if their child's going to be sacrificed to the gods. Uh, young virgins, because the gods are usually thought of as, uh, uh, you know, powerful uh, male warriors that uh, uh, would like beautiful young virgins to raise their god children. 
And uh, they don't want someone experienced. They want a, a woman that has not yet been violated. They want a virgin, and so virgins are also uh, valuable. The other thing is champions. Um, it's funny because they have uh, certain kinds of uh, games, I guess similar to the Olympic Games in Greece, uh, in Central America. And after the games were con uh, concluded, they would have a, uh, a sacrifice, sometimes of many, many human beings. And um, uh, some people thought that, well, I guess they <laughs> wouldn't want to be the losers of those games and get sacrificed. But finally, some anthropologists says, wait, that doesn't make any sense. Um, the gods don't want the losers, you know, at least not in a petitionary sacrifice. It would be the winners. The winners are the ones that are worthy to go and become the servants or the army of the gods. So it was probably the winners that were sacrificed. Now, there would be an exception to the rule, and that's a different kind of sacrifice. That would be a thanksgiving sacrifice. If you had gone into battle and your god had given you the victory and you came back with a few thousand captives, then you might give a percentage of those captives as a sacrifice to thank the god. And in that case, technically, you're sacrificing the losers uh, to the god for giving you the victory over them. So that would be a little bit different kind of scenario. Uh, but in any case, this is uh, where the sacrificial systems uh, begin. And, of course, the written epics um, occur in this period. And um, so you can see a great deal of change between what we call the primal period, primal cultures, primal religion, and the archaic cultures and archaic religion. And um, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this probably when we get together in class here. Um, so thanks for watching the video. If you have any questions whatsoever, shoot me an email or a message on uh, the uh, class canvas website, and I will get back to you. And um, we've already talked about the, uh, the timeline in class. We introduced the timeline and how we tell time in history. And you also have a document on the website uh, called Axial Age Reading, uh, which is an essay I wrote just explaining the next major transition, which is from about 800 to about 200 BCE, a much shorter period of time, 600 years, and much more recent, uh, when humans go through another uh, very, very important transition. So uh, please also read uh, the Axial Age reading that I provided online, and uh, then we'll uh, talk later about that second major transition. All right, thanks for tuning in, and I will see you next time.